Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to the Song of Songs. If you have an older version Bible, it might say the Song of Solomon, but it's the Song of Songs. And this year at Night of Worship, we are studying songs from the Bible. And there's lots of different songs in the Bible. This is one that even the title of it is the Song of Songs. Some people don't realize that the whole thing is a song. It's all one song. And it's a very interesting song because it's a love song. And our theme tonight is really to look at the topic of love and the reality of God's love. And it, although that not all love is God, God by definition is love. So when God is present, he's, he's bringing love into the world. He's bringing love into our relationships. And so if you have your Bibles and you open the Song of Songs, the first chapter, I want to read, and I want to kind of give you an interesting look at this. And, and if you read Song of Songs, you don't realize it's, it's actually in different voices. It gets very confusing. So the part I'm going to read from chapter one of Song of Songs is four different voices. The first person is the narrator, kind of setting up the song. The next voice is the woman who's in love with the man, who's Solomon, the king of Jerusalem. The next voice is going to be their friends. And then we're going to jump through a couple things. We're going to look at his voice, her voice. And I want you to get the sense of what's going on here because this is a romantic celebration of love. And when God is present, every kind of love becomes what it should be. When you're friends and God is present, the love between friends becomes beautiful and powerful. When you're family and God is present, the love in a family can make it through tough times and can make things the way they should be. When you're in a romantic relationship as God's designed, when God brings together a man and a woman who love each other, God's present, that, that love becomes powerful. And when you come into the presence of God, you experience love in the way you never have before. But when God is present, he brings love to everything. This is specifically about romantic love. So it begins these, this way in Song of Songs, chapter one, verse one. Solomon's Song of Songs. That's the commentary saying, this is what it is. This is Solomon's song above all songs, the best of songs. And then she sings. And just a little note here. So we have to see some kids in the room. Uh, in the ancient Jewish world, uh, the Song of Songs was reserved for kids for over 13. If you're under 13, if you were not bar mitzvahs or bas mitzvah, if you were, then you actually weren't supposed to read it because it's kind of sassy, but I'm not going to get too sassy. I'm going to only read certain parts of it, all right? But she says this. Here's how she, she starts out easy. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Okay, that's a good start, right? She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes, she says to him. Your name is like perfume poured out. Lots of perfume. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away to be with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. And now the friends jump in. And listen to what they say. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. The friends say, we love this. We, we love love. They celebrate love. We should learn to celebrate when God is moving, when God, God who is love shows up and love is happening in whatever way, in a family, in a marriage, in, 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 a, in a community, in a church, between a person and God. We should cheer that on. We should, in, a, in a world that's broken and hurting and angry and polarized, right? We should celebrate every time we see God's love breaking in in every kind of relationship. Jump to verse nine. Because now he, he joins the song. He sings to her. And he uses a funny comparison. I'll explain it in a second here. He says, I liken you, my daughter. So this is him speaking to this woman who's celebrating his, you know, how, how wonderful he is. He says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of pearls. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. I'm going to give you wonderful gifts. But he starts out by saying, you make me think of a horse <laughs> to her. And that might not seem like a compliment, Right? says, you would liken, you, I liken you, my darling, to a mare. But, but specifically, listen, a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Now, here's the picture. I'll give it to you really short, a short picture. Pharaoh's chariot horses were all stallions. If you want to fire up the stallions and get them to run at a higher horsepower, you know what you do? Put them by a mare. That's what they did in the ancient world. If they wanted chariot horses to run faster, they would put a mare near them and the mare would actually supercharge the stallion. So he says, he's saying to her, you supercharge me. You can take it from there, okay? Uh, she says back, now this is just, a, I'm reading right from my Bible. You follow along in your Bibles? If you're getting nervous, get over it. This is the Bible, all right? Because God who is love, God loves love. Amen? Amen. 
God celebrates love. So she says, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me like a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the valleys of En Gedi. And he says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. That works better than the horses, doesn't it? You know, some imagery, you know, but that's, that, okay. And she says back, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming. Our bed is lavish. It's verdant. It's lush. Okay, we're going to stop there, all right? <laughs> but it goes on like that. A whole book of the Bible that's a love song. Why would God Almighty, the God of heaven, put a big book in the middle of the Bible all about romantic love? Because God is the God of love. And when he's present and we're functioning right. Now we can take love and take it out of context. We can take love and we can mess it up. We got the ability as human beings to mess up pretty much anything. But God, when we do things the right way, God celebrates love. When, it, when, it, when it's honoring to him, he rejoices in it. And so, so as you read Song of Songs, and I encourage you to, to look at it, it. Now, here's the thing. Song of Songs is addressing romantic love. I've listened to pastors do some gymnastics and try to say the primary focus of Song of Songs is God's love for his church and the church's love for God. That's the primary interpretation. I simply say, I don't think that's, when I read this, I'm not reading primarily, first and foremost, God's love for the, now, theologians have a term called telescoping, and it actually makes sense. Telescoping is, is where you kind of look at something and you see it, but then the further out you step, you kind of look at that bigger concentric circles and get a bigger understanding of what it means. Song of Songs, if you go all the way and you look at really close, I think it's talking about romantic love and the, the God who made love, the God of love, when, when it's in the right context, celebrates romantic love. I think when you kind of take a step further back, you realize that God is love and he's a designer of every kind of love that is honoring to him. And so I think we can say there's, a, and if you take another step back, you can say, so that includes this God of love who loves all of us and you can get to that application, but it's not the primary one. Get it? It's not the first, when you read, when they read, when they read Song of Songs in the ancient world, they knew exactly what it was. It was a love song between a man and a woman. And so, but, but then when you get the bigger picture, you see that God is a God of love. And so we're going to look at this. We're going we're gonna to start here by saying, okay, the God who made us delights in love. Now we're going we're gonna to kind of take a step back and look at a bigger picture. So every song has a setting. If you read the Bible, every song that you read has a setting. So when you're reading the Psalms, which are 150 different songs, the best thing you can try to do is get the setting that that psalm was written in so you understand the context. In this context, the setting is one of, of a man and a woman and a romantic love. And don't miss that through the Song of Songs, the friends look on and celebrate. The friends go, we're so happy for you. We're so glad for you. And I would hope as Christians, when you see a couple that are married who love each other, when God has brought together a man and a woman and they've fallen in love, we need to cheer that on because our world is not right now. Our world is kind of on the attack against marriage. We have anybody Christians who should celebrate marriage and rejoice in that. Every song has a setting. This one is romantic love. Every song has a singer. Every song has a singer. And most of the songs in the Bible, you know who's singing the song. This one's interesting because the, the narrator just starts at the beginning, but it's really the man and the woman singing back and forth and occasionally the friends. And when you read it, you have to kind of see, then it says friends. And you go, oh, now it's the friends jumping in going, yeah. And they're kind of like this chorus cheering them on. All right? Every song has a singer. Every song has a central message. And I think the central message of the Song of Songs is it's the context is romantic love. But I think that the central message is this, that the God who made us is a God of love more than we can even comprehend. And in the moments when you see God and his love for you and his joy for you and his delight in you and you feel his love, in those moments when it just overwhelms you, that's like a thimble of the ocean of God's love that he has for you. In the moments where you have most experienced the love of God, in the middle of a worship service or out in creation somewhere where you see the glory of what God's made and you feel God's love, when you've confessed something to God that you've kept in your soul and you feel his, his forgiveness just wash over you. In those moments where you just say, oh, he does love me. 
There's going to come a day you see Jesus face to face when all that will pale. And you will be overwhelmed by the greatness of the love of God, the infinite, staggering love of God. God celebrates love because God is love. And that, that, that love that God brings, Song of Songs is one expression of that. But when we think about God's love through the scriptures, we read about, about um, our, you know, our love for God, that we are called to love God and God fills us with his spirit in a way that, that we can celebrate his love. And I hope tonight, when we come to the table in a little bit, when we break the bread and drink the cup, you're able to say, God, I love you. Thank you that your body was broken. Your blood was shed. You gave your life for me. Thank you, Lord. The Bible talks about God's love for us, all that he's done. Not only do we express our love to God, but there's times we just go like this. Lord, I need to receive your love. For some of you tonight, some of you are online, some of you are here on campus, but you're like, man, I, I haven't had anybody look at me and say to me, I love you in a long time. Some of you have kids that you've poured into and they not only don't say I love you, they may say nothing at all or sometimes they say the opposite. You go, man, I pray tonight as we worship, you hear the voice of God say, I love you. I gave my son for you. I delight in you. That's the heart of God. When you read the scriptures, you see love for family and the call to respect family and honor family, that we should have love in our family. When you read the scriptures, you see love between friends. That's part of God's plan. If we walk in Jesus Christ, we find ourselves, in the, you know what the Bible talks about? Loving your enemies. What? In our world? What? Are you kidding? That's God. God is love. He would even call us to love those who hate us, to pray for those who persecute us. When you walk in God, every part of your life begins to see love kind of open up and blossom. If you have your Bibles, look with me at 1 John chapter 4. It'll be on the screens as well. 1 John chapter 4, beginning of verse 7, is this amazing passage about, about God's love for us, our love for God, and how that love, when God's love fills us, it overflows to other people. It's just it's, You see love all over the place here when you're, when you're walking in God. Dear friends, 1 John 4, 7, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Okay, let's love each other. Everyone knows who, every, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. When you're loving, it shows that you're walking in him, right? Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If you can't love, you're going, okay, then is God really in me? Because God is love. Verse nine, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, that, that's the broken bread, right? That's the cup poured out. This is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins that he gave his life for us. Now listen to this, verse 11. So dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Are you, are you getting it? It's just God loves us. We love God. God loves us so much, we love others. There's just love breaking out all over the place here. All right? No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You know what that's saying? When, when we love each other the way God wants, the world sees the completion of God's love, the outworking of God's love. And the world will know our, we are Christians, Jesus said in John 15, by the way we love one another. Love is a witness to the world. Love reveals the presence of the power of God. Well, great songs can move a heart. Great songs can move a heart. When, when a love song is sung, when somebody hears a song of love, when, when a friend loves someone well, when, someone, when, when a middle school, high school, you know, college student kind of falls in love for the first time, they're like, everything, the world is wonderful. If that love stops, the world's not so wonderful. It's like, love, it's powerful. It's just powerful. But God is in this. And so we got to say, okay, then, this, then God's song of love for us should change us and transform us. The greatest songs can transform a life. And so we've got to look to God's word and the songs that he sings. God sings a love song over each one of us. God's love for us is greater than we imagine or dream. So I'm going to invite you just to reflect for a minute. I'm going to invite you just to quiet your heart. If you want to bow your head, you can. I'll have some questions I'm going to read out loud, but also have on the screens. And just take a moment and think deeply. 
about each of these questions. Do you live with a deep awareness that you are loved by God? In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, do you just have a sense, I, God truly loves me. I may not always deserve it. I might mess up at times, but I know he loves me because he wants you to know that. He wants you to understand that. Here's another question. Do you seek to express your love to God in fresh and honest ways? Do you seek to let God know that you love him? Do you tell him? Do you sing to him? Do you sing of him? Do you declare his goodness? And one more question. Do you let God's love overflow from you to the people he's placed in your life? If you're married, can you say, you're my beloved. I celebrate you. And if not, ask God to help you grow in love. In your friendships, can you say to your friends, I so appreciate you. I really think of the world of you. I, I love you. I mean it in a wholesome, godly way to let people know you love them. Family members. You know, when I talk to people who say, I was in my 30s or 40s before my dad told me he loved me out loud for the first time, I think, boy, we're missing something. God, fill our hearts to overflow with love. Do you tell your brothers and sisters in Christ what they mean to you? Because if God is love and God lives inside of us, love flows through us. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me about love. What we're going to do is we're going to read a few scriptures in unison together. And if you're at home online, I'm going to ask you to read these out loud. They'll be on your screen at home. And, and so we're going to read first an expression of praise and love to God. This is Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2. Let's bring that up on the screen here and up on the screens at home. And I want to ask you to read this out loud with me. And as you read it out loud with me, think about the words. Make this your declaration. You ready? Here we go. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Look at that prayer. Look at that declaration, those words, fortress, deliverer, rock, refuge, shield, salvation. Wow. I added the wow. <laughs> That's our God. Let's just pray together for a moment. Oh God, in the quiet of our hearts, I'm gonna give you a little prompt, but I want you to tell God, would you just speak to God? of how he, how you love him because he's protected you. He's been your refuge. He's watched over you. He's had his hand upon you. Will you just take a moment and talk to him about that? Hmm. And as you're thinking about that prayer, as you're expressing that to God, we're going to read another passage. And we're going to lift it thanks to God for his great love. So again, look at the screens. And in unison, we're going to read together John 3, 16 and 17. We know John 3, 16 pretty well, most of us, but maybe not 3, 17. Let's, let's together in unison, from your heart, declare this truth together. You ready? Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Will you just for a moment say, God, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. As we prepare to come to the table and break the bread and drink the cup, will you just say, Jesus, thank you for your body broken. Thank you for your bloodshed. Take a moment and just thank God for the price he paid to show his love for you, the gift of Jesus. Hmm. And keeping your heart in that prayerful place, we're going to read together 1 Corinthians 13, 7, 4 through 7. This is the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, explaining what love looks like. Often read at weddings, but this is really love in the church, love among God's people. 
What does our love look like? If, if God is love, if he fills us, how do we overflow with love? And here's what it looks like. Together in unison at home, read it out loud. Here in the worship center together, look at the screens there in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning of verse 4. Let's declare this together. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Oh God, hear our hearts. We want to become an overflowing well of your love. We want to be so in love with you and so aware of your love for us, so filled up with your love that if we're in a, a romantic relationship, it overflows with your presence and your love. And our families, that we would overflow with your love. In the church, that we would keep no record of wrongs, that we would be quick to forgive, that your love would just take over our hearts and our lives. You, God of love, hear our hearts. And here's your prayer direction. Who's someone that you're finding it hard to love? You say, Pastor, this has been such a good service so far. Why would you bring this up? Because God cares. Who are you finding it hard to love right now? And would you say, God of love, fill me with your love. Some of you have to pray, God, I got nothing to give this person right now. I got nothing to give. But if you will fill me, I will overflow. Will you ask God to fill you to overflowing with his love in general and for that specific person? that's on your heart. Just take a minute and talk to God about that. And some of you are just starting that prayer. Keep praying that prayer as the Spirit leads you. But always in these, in these messages and nights of worship, we finish with an invitation to sing passionately. I want you to think about how deep the Father's love is, the greatness of his love, the power of his love, beyond our comprehension. And from your heart, not just your voice, from your heart and from your soul, as you feel led, sing and join the worship team. Make this your prayer. Just keeping your hearts in that place of worship. As we prepare to come to the table, Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, prophesying the coming of the Messiah, Jesus our Savior. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. For we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at those words in that sixth verse. Whether you're at home on your screen there or here on the screens. Just this honest acknowledgement. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. We all have those moments, those seasons, those years some, in some cases where we just do our own thing. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. While we ran, while we wandered, while we were still caught in our sin, Christ came to die for us. That's love. That's the love of God. That's the love that changes the life and eternity and all that we are. Listen as we continue from Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine 
until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. If you're at home tonight, we're so glad you're with us. We invite you to get some crackers and juice, some bread, some wine, whatever you have that's available. And in one hand, hold the, the bread, reminding you of the body of Christ, the other hand, the cup. For those gathered here, we'll do something a little different tonight. In a moment, when it's the right time, we'll invite you to come to the stations. There's stations right at the doors as you come in here and along the walls. There's four different stations. And when you go there, just pick up the elements. It's, it's a, a little cup like this. And on the bottom, if you peel off the bottom, there's a little wafer there. You can hold that in one hand. And then if you peel off the top, you have the juice ready. And then when that time comes to go to the table, you can partake right there at the table. Or you can come to the front and kneel. And there's a place you can kind of set the elements here and spend, spend a moment praying and partake. Or you go back to your seat and partake. But we want to give you a special invitation tonight. Uh, and if you're, on, if you're online, find something to write with and a piece of paper, something to write on and something to write with. Here we've got post-it notes across the tables here by these crosses. Well, here's what we want you to do tonight. It's an expression to God. Just write down on one of those post-it notes some way that God has shown his love for you. Some way that you've experienced or seen his love. A small thing in your life, but something big, whatever. It's something God's done, something God's done through another person. But you just say, I saw the love of God. I felt the love of God. And would you write that down and then just go post it on one of the crosses. There's one over here and there's one on this side. And some people have already started to do that. Some of our band members knew they were going to be up here. So they already posted before the service. But just, you don't have to do that. But if it would be meaningful for you to express to God a way you've experienced or appreciate his love, when the time comes, go to the tables, receive the elements, post that, and you can partake of the communion along the walls there where the tables are in the front here or back at your seat. Uh, we won't give you, we won't say now partake. When you're ready, partake of the elements. But we remember that communion reminds us of what it took to wash away our sins. When you hold the elements in your hands, remember that it was the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus that washes away your sins. Communion is a time to confess. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've, each gone, we've done our own thing. We've gone our own way. Whether that's been happening in your life, bring it to the cross. Confess that to Jesus. That's part of communion, acknowledging why you need his grace. Communion brings joy in the reality of cleansing. It reminds you that because his body was broken, because his blood was shed, our sins are washed away, that by his stripes, we are healed. So walk in that wholeness. And communion reminds us that we are loved. We are loved by the God of love, the God who is love. And so hear these words to prepare us to partake of the bread and to partake of the cup. The bread reminds us of the body of Jesus, his love, his sacrifice, and what a gift that was. It's his body that was literally broken for you. After being whipped over and over again and having a cross put on his back to carry it to Golgotha, the place of the skull, where he would hang on a cross and die for us. But as you partake in this, don't forget his body that was beaten and broken for you. And when you take the elements, remember that in that cup that you hold, it's a reminder, it's a picture that his blood was poured out. That the final sacrifice, the last sacrifice that will ever need to be offered for you was offered in Jesus. You don't have to bring sacrifices to a temple you don't have to bring, you know, beat yourself up. But you receive the final sacrifice of Jesus. And then you follow him. You take his hand and you know the greatness of his love. So when you partake of the cup, when you're ready, whether you're at your seat or up front, wherever you are, when you partake of that cup, just remember the price that Jesus paid. He poured out his life to give you life. As you partake, just say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. So we want to invite you as the worship team leads in this song, Nothing Else. When you're ready, just step up from where you are, 
Go to one of the tables, get the elements. Come forward, express how you've experienced God's love. If you are physically not able to get up and come forward to one of these tables and make that move around the room, we got team members ready with baskets of the elements. Just raise your hand and they'll kind of look for you and they'll find you, they'll bring it right to you, okay? So we want to make sure we meet your needs. And so, and if, if gluten's a problem, these are gluten-free wafers, so we're all good. Let's just kind of, with peace in our hearts and joy in God's love, when you're ready, come to the tables because Jesus has prepared them. Let's partake together. Thank you.